ShotGlassDigital.com. Rebel Force Radio's Fangirls Going Rogue is brought to you by Little Debbie Snacks and their new Cosmic Cupcakes. Rebel Force Radio presents... Hello, what have we here? Fangirls Going Rogue. I met her in a Jedi chat room. Star Wars news, topics, and conversation from the female point of view. I like the sound of that. With Trisha Barr and Teresa Delgado. This is Fangirls Going Rogue. Hey everybody, this is Fangirls Going Rogue. It's episode 13, but it's technically our one year anniversary because in 2013, our first episode came out in November. We have turned one, which means, Trisha, what does it mean? We're in first grade now. Podcasting first grade. Great. Yep, we graduated podcast kindergarten. I'm pretty proud of us. I think that that's a major accomplishment because some shows don't even get past year one. But we did. It gives you new appreciation that people don't just sit down and record. You have to do your homework and be prepared and talk to a lot of people and work out schedules. So it's definitely it's like learning how to do project management. It's crazy to see how much work it takes to go on a podcast. So I appreciate everybody who does it now so much more than when I was just listening. I know. I know how you feel. But we reached out to a bunch of our friends for birthday messages. So throughout the show, you're going to hear some awesome messages from some of our friends and our favorite podcasters in the Star Wars podcasting galaxy. But first up, Vanessa Marshall. Hi, this is Vanessa Marshall. I play Harrison Dula on Star Wars Rebels, and I just wanted to wish Fangirls Going Rogue a very happy birthday. Congratulations on graduating podcast kindergarten. Flail! So, Trisha, we've gotten some news. Really? Was there news? <laughs> yeah, it kind of just side-swiped us out of no, nowhere. No. I have to tell you, so I'm in a business meeting out in the field, literally standing on the side of a busy, busy road. And my phone is going, ding, 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 ding. And I'm like, that's my Twitter notification. What is happening? Then my text started going off and I'm like, oh no, oh no, this is, this is not good. And I had to pay attention. It was a test of my patience to not look at that phone and see what it was. It was The Force Awakened. So what did you think? (laughs) Well, I got the email or something. I don't remember how it went. It was either Twitter first and then the email from Tracy. I don't know what happened to me because I was super productive that day. Then all production was stopped and halted and just done. I saw it. I'm like, okay, yeah, The Force Awakens. And then I started just watching Twitter and this insane barrage of hilarious jokes just started for the rest of the day and I could not stop laughing and I know everybody was doing it in love and all that kind of stuff but it just oh my god my side hurt because I was laughing so hard because everybody was saying the next episode will be the force hits snooze and then the next one will be the force says mom five more minutes you know, and then there was people saying that there needs to be a merchandising thing like with Folgers or something. <laughs> calf. Calf. <laughs> the calf of the galaxy. <laughs> I actually really like the title. Okay, I have... Oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry. Was that C-3PO? <laughs> yeah, that was my, like, strangely Australian Siri guy on my phone. If it's not cats, it's Siri that decides to start talking by itself. So, in all seriousness, though, with The Force Awakens, I actually really like the title. I'm not really sure what it means. I think it it opens itself up to a lot of places. It could go a lot of different ways. And you know me, I'm not a super big speculator, but apparently that's been happening lately. (laughs) She got bit by the bug, and I love it. (laughs) If you want to hear me actually speculate, go and listen to the last episode of Disney Vault Talk's Rebel Yell um, about, um, oh, breaking ranks in that episode because holy smokes, (laughs) that's all I'm going to say. So, Trisha, what do you think? I love it. It's active. It opens up 
the force is not necessarily Jedi or Sith. We don't know if it means what it means. We don't know what it means. And I'll be honest, the Phantom Menace, I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> That's what I feel like. So I, we may not know what it really means until it's all over. So, you know, it's one of those things that the title, a title is everything and nothing for a story. And that's very, I don't know, existential maybe, but that it makes me excited. And I know some people are like, oh, I don't like it, but it's a Star Wars movie. Don't sweat the stuff. Yeah. And once we're on episode nine, you're going to love it. So you just wait, have- just wait 20 years. <laughs> I have to admit that I was just shocked and amazed. I shouldn't be how quickly people had things up to, you know, that they made pictures and done the title and figured out what font it was. I'm like, wow, you guys are good fans. Love it. Well, fans are that way. That's not the only cool thing that's happened in the last week. You know, we're monthly, so we have to we have to talk about everything exciting the Clone Wars is out on Blu-ray now. You can watch instead of having to sit in front of your computer and watch those little missing. Um, well, what are they? The Lost the, Mission. So the last the, season of the Clone Wars. Yes, you can watch them, and there's all sorts of little goodies in there. And Teresa, she reviewed it for Chip and Company. So go check it out. What she has to say, we'll provide a link in the show notes if you're still not sure or on the fence. But the Clone Wars is awesome. It's great, and I know everybody is you know talking about how awesome it was on Netflix and how good it looked, but it looks even better on the Blu-ray actually than it did on Netflix. There's a really awesome 16 minute documentary feature that goes behind the Clone Wars, and it's really cool. And it's never be- you've never no one's seen it before anywhere except for on this particular Blu-ray. So um. If you get a chance, go and pick that up. Also, there is something happening in the world of Star Wars podcasting. Um, the podcast Far, Far Away Radio has decided to do the Star Wars Podcast Fan Awards. And what these are going to be is basically shows are nominated in different categories. And then podcasters will get to actually vote. And then also the fans will get to vote. So, or fans i call i don't like calling people fans i'd rather call them listeners so the listeners will get to vote and then we will um find out who the winners are fangirls going rogue has been nominated in several categories that's pretty exciting it is exciting we asked for listener feedback on our last show trisha we strongly asked for voicemails and our our calls were answered. They were. And we got lots of awesome voicemails. And we actually said that the first person that left us a voicemail would get a signed or an autographed photo of Hera that is signed by Vanessa Marshall. That would be Rudy from Washington. And we'll play his voicemail. Hey, fangirls, this is Meridian Blade. Been listening since day one and loved it. Congratulations on graduating to kindergarten. I have to say Ewoks are awesome. I just got the Ewok Village Lego set, and holy cow, it is epic. Keep up the good work and hope to listen to you for at least another year, if not ten. Bye. So congratulations, Rudy. You win a signed picture of Harris, signed by Vanessa Marshall. So if you could, send us an email or just call us and leave us another voicemail. Um, and we will mail you this picture. So next up is Anthony from North Carolina. Hey, fangirls going rogue. It's Anthony, a fanboy. Just wanted to say congrats on your one-year anniversary. I truly enjoy your show. Keep up the great work. Thanks, Anthony, for your words of encouragement and your support. We really, really, really appreciate it. I'm, these voicemails, they literally made my whole week when they came in after the last show. Me too. Me too. There's so much positivity coming from these voicemails. So next up is Matt from Kansas. Hey, fangirls. This is Matt Marks. Uh, wondering your thoughts on this. Just stay over... Uh do some more animated shows after Rebels. Well, I was thinking they need to do a Mace Windu and Jar Jar Binks spin-off. But then after that, maybe uh, Wicket and Kitwar's Adventures. Anyway, I hope I um, am the first voicemailer. If you give me a plush Ewok, I will give it to my son, and it will be his teddy bear. Okay, 
Uh, keep up the great work with the show. Bye. Matt is awesome because Matt listens to a lot of shows. Now, the funny thing about this is that he left us that voicemail, and then I think he realized what I actually was giving away because he listened later in the show. <laughs> and so he sent us an email said that I left a voicemail right after you said there was a contest, and you'll hear in the voicemail that I didn't know what the prize was. I then resumed listening, and you announced the prize. <laughs> In response to his show pitch ideas, we like pitching stuff here. I am down for the Wicket, the adventures of Wicket and Kitwar. <laughs> I, knew, I knew you would be. He he was on to what would be up your alleys. We, then we got a call from Vintage Star Wars, which I think is our first international message. I don't know if we've gotten any international emails. It just feels like one big community. So sometimes you don't realize people are across the pond or out of the United States. Hey, Teresa. Hey, Trisha. This is Vintage Star Wars from Instagram. I just listened to you guys' show for the first time, and you guys were sad about not getting any voicemails. So I thought I'd send you a voicemail and tell you that you guys have a fantastic show, and I'll be listening from now on. And may the force be with you. Our last voicemail is from a good friend of the show. It would be Chickafant and Chickafant's dad, and Chickafant is a big fan, and he's really nice. People probably, some people probably don't know what I'm talking about. Chickafant is a little stuffed chicken, but he goes everywhere. He has his own Facebook page, his own Instagram, and everything, and he does really cool stuff. Um, and his parents are amazing people. Um, they're super nice, and they're also fans of the show. Hey, Teresa and Trisha, this is Chickafant's dad. Just wanted to call. Um, it felt appropriate to call on World Ewok Appreciation Day and say thank you for the wonderful job the two of you do for all of fandom, no matter what gender, creed. Um, or even, um, I guess you could say, race uh, or species out there. So, again, thank you for the wonderful Fangirls Going Rogue show. You both do a great job. So, again, thank you from Chickafant's Chica dad, Chickafant's mom, and Darth Magnus. Yep, yep. Oh, Chickafant and Chickafant's dad and mom, thank you so much for your kind words and your support. And we got to meet them all at their Rebel Force Radio meetup at Star Wars Weekends. So that was my first Chickafant photo, and I sort of fangirl flailed about it. Yep, and I actually just got to see Chickafant last weekend. Um, they were at Disney World when I was there, and I got to see them after I got off of It's a Small World. Our first email is from Brian Bailey, and he says, Hey, Trisha and Teresa, I wanted to say congratulations on reaching your one-year anniversary of Fangirls Going Rogue. I am so, so thankful that you decided to share your passions and talents with us. Building careers writing about the things you love makes you excellent role models for fangirls everywhere. In a world full of hate and oppression telling young girls they're not true fans, their opinions don't matter, your podcast is a bright, shining star giving hope to young girls. Fangirls who just want to be accepted and respected by the fandoms they love, whatever level they may be. Keep up the great work. You're making a bigger Im impact than you'll ever fully know. I look forward to the day when I can share your work with my daughter in the coming years. Pink lightsabers forever. Sincerely, Brian Bailey. And he's at Balls and Play on Twitter. That, like, almost made me cry when I read it the first time because it's just so kind. So thank you, Brian, for reaching out to us and taking a moment to share that with us because we do the show and we put it out there and we just hope that we're doing a good job. So it's always good to hear from people. So thank you. The emails kept flowing in and yes, we did get more international. We got the seven Max who's, he says he's a little artist from Germany and a new listener to the show started with episode eight with wonderful Bethany Blanton from Star Wars Report. So thank you for the email and for uh, writing in and letting it, letting us know that you started listening and we hope you continue to listen. And then we had Brian Lucas. He said, hello, hope this finds you both in good health. I've been listening for a few episodes and caught you on full of Sith. Yay, that was so much fun. The fangirls going Sith. I was wondering if you can give me a lady's view on something. My wife and I play TOR and notice a lot of men playing female tunes. It's hard to tell who is really a female. Also, some of the men play female tunes to get free stuff pretending to be ladies. With this can cause less ladies not to play or even feeling the pressure of it 
and cause them to quit. So I'm not a gamer. So I'm, I read this one and I'm tossing it to the answer to Teresa. <laughs> well, I do play Star Wars The Old Republic. I could see how that could be discouraging, but I think that part of what a lot of role playing game people do is they like to create all kinds of different characters. So they like to create females, they like to create males, they like, and you know, there are always going to be the outliers, the ones who try and you know, use the characters and the community, you know, to get things or whatever. And this is something that it just happens. You know, there's not a lot you can do about it. Personally, I choose to just ignore those people. And I don't really look at it as if it's a certain gender that's playing as a girl or a boy or whatever. And, you know, it, it makes me really sad to think that it could cause other girls to stop playing. But um, I guess it really also depends on how you're playing the game. Because when I play, I don't tend to do a whole lot with other people a lot of the time. Because my husband plays too, so he'll go on missions with me and things like that. Um, and he's a higher level than me, so he kills all the people. <laughs> but, um, you know, I totally get what you're saying, and there are definitely things that need to change everywhere, you know, from gaming to toys to all over the place in fandom, and this is definitely an area that maybe people could start being more respectful of other genders, and, you know, it's just one of those things that we have to fight and bring awareness to, so thank you. Hi there, it's Mark Newbold here from Radio 1138, and I'd like to wish Teresa and Trisha a very happy first anniversary. Congratulations on graduating podcast kindergarten. You guys do such a great show. Love it, really enjoy it. Keep doing what you're doing. Long may it continue. Love you guys. Take care. Mark Newbold, so sweet. He is. And I was so happy that we got one from him. <laughs> it's the little things. The little things. We thought it would be appropriate for us to take a look back at the year that we have had and it's been quite a year why don't we just start with you know some things of how you know we personally have changed in our fandom over the last year I know that I found my voice more as far as you know being the person that for our show and for other shows that part of my job in, you know, cause we do have jobs of things that we do for the show and, you know, things I take care of things. Trisha takes care of those kind of things. And I became kind of like our PR person. So I had to find my way into the world of asking for interviews and asking for products to review and things like that. And um, I feel like I've gotten pretty good at it. And I'm kind of, it's just something that I'm proud of that I've, you know, really learned how to do it. And um, I'm still learning. We've gotten a lot of really cool interviews. So yay. What people don't realize when Teresa is talking about this, when we interviewed Mary Franklin, that was one of our ladies that we wanted to have on the show, someone who inspires us. And Teresa literally chased her down at start. She saw her and I, I put in the show notes that we put on our running shoes because Mary's like a ball of energy and in charge of so much stuff. But Teresa literally had to, she saw her and she made it happen. So, you know, those are the things that you just have to have the right moment. Sometimes you have to have the right opportunity because a lot of times you can ask and it's just not a good time for the interviews or there's so many other things going on. So a lot of it's just making opportunities and can be intimidating. You don't want to press too hard, but at the same time, there's a lot of other people out there trying to get the same thing. So you've done a fabulous job and people don't realize how much work it takes to coordinate just one interview, just like you said, getting the timing and connections. So <laughs> it takes a lot of time. <laughs> I have over the last year talking about Star Wars and getting feedback from other people is just really appreciate the great intention behind the story and what it means for for people across all lifestyles and just anybody. Star Wars literally is for everyone we're starting to really see people recognize that. And it's just been one of the amazing things about being able to just get beyond just blogging. Cause Teresa and I were both bloggers and you know, now we get to communicate with people even more and more. So another way that I feel like I've kind of changed over the past year, I guess would be 
that I've stepped up my game as far as interacting with listeners of all of my shows on Twitter and like Twitter mentions and stuff and trying to make sure that people know that I am hearing them and that I do see the tweets that they're sending me and stuff like that and trying to make it, you know, to where we're more of a community and that they don't feel like their podcast hosts hosts are, you know, these people that just exist out there in the world. (laughs) And just including my listeners, and I, I think that's a really good thing. <laughs> this is this is how Teresa masters it by walking and her little thumbs going on the phone as fast as she can. So <laughs> it's amazing to watch. I cannot do that, so I <laughs> respond as quickly as I can, but never at the speed that Teresa can. <laughs> so it is. She's like trying to show me. I'm like, no, that's not going to happen. It would only end with me falling on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things too, we already talked about just being able to get these interviews and how much you have to work at it and make connections. And a lot of times just being more in the culture and a lot of the opportunities we had, you get to speak to more people who are part of Lucasfilm and or part of creating Star Wars products. And Teresa was the one who really spearheaded after the New York Toy Fair when we didn't see the type of toys that we were hoping to see from the female characters, especially Hera and Sabine, who we love and are awesome. And a lot of times you get you get it just on the side where someone from Lucasfilm will say, or someone in the Star Wars community that's working on it, there's just not the interest from the women or they're just don't buy the toys or they're just not buying the books and comics. I hear, hear that a lot. It's just sort of in, it's sort of ingrained. Like it's some myth that they, they've learned, but I don't, I don't think that it's really been given a fair shake. The women haven't really been given a fair shake yet as consumers. We're working on it. We're talking about it. We we are here to highlight the many ways that women are fans. One of the things I learned is I try really hard to just over this past year has learned that we really have to impress on everybody in that culture that, that you have to believe in your fans before they buy from you. So a lot of it is just sort of like Yoda says, you have to believe you can lift the X-Wing out of the swamp. And Ahsoka has to believe she can do something before it happens. And, you know, the same lesson, Luke had to believe his father was redeemable. So sometimes I hope that find a way. That's one of the things I've just really brought into my recognition that we have to impress on everybody, the people inside that you have to believe in the customers. And if you hear that within, you know, your circles, tell them that you don't believe it either, that the people inside need to help us. We're out here. We want to be buying stuff from you and make Star Wars the best thing ever. So, but we need everybody to believe it. So we have our pixie dust and we're spreading it out and hopefully it works like magic. My last thing for how I've changed is that I've become a conventional holic. I have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm confronting it, but it's not going to go away because I love them so much. Some of the best times of my life this past year have been at conventions. So Star Wars weekends, a convention, I do you count, count it as one big giant month convention. <laughs> Oh, man, I hope they don't make it like six or seven or the eternal Star Wars. No, actually, I do, because that would be really awesome. It means the franchise is really successful, but <laughs> <laughs> Teresa may not be able to keep up. No, uh, if that <laughs> happens, I might die. Let's not do that and say we did. And I think you have one more thing. It is the a realization you just think you're doing a podcast. And you're just talking about what you believe in. And then one point you realize how important it is that what we're doing is for other people. And that comes from the voicemails and the listeners and the feedback. So you guys empower us and we hope we're empowering you. And I hear so many people, I read people that were inspired by Star Wars and you know, we see these people doing amazing things like Christopher Nolan, who has Interstellar and J.J. Abrams and all these sorts of creative people. Our goal has been to kind of elevate the recognition of the female members of the community. And I every day I realize how important it is and that we're doing a valuable thing, too. And it's sometimes it's OK to pat yourself on the back and say, let's go. Let's keep doing this. 
13 months ago imagining what Star Wars was. We didn't even know what Rebels was going to be. It was just all in our imagination. The Clone Wars had just ended. And so to see where we are, we've come so far, and I only think it'll get better, right? I would think so. We also wanted to take a look at some of the things that have happened to us in our fandom because we've each had some pretty big things happen this year. One of my biggest things is that I've had a, the great opportunity to spend quite a bit of time with several of the cast members from Rebels and to actually just become friends with them. And, you know, it's it's been amazing to be able to relate to Rebels on that level and, um, you know, just to talk to them and get to know them as real people and not just these voice actors that I idolize. You know, that was the difference between me and Rebels and me and the Clone Wars is I came into the Clone Wars and learned who these people were and I've been fans of them forever and now getting to be friends with them after the show is over. Like, it's kind of cool becoming friends with them before the show even starts. I think we've both learned just how amazing the people are. Just the cast, before they even started recording, they hired an amazing group of people and it makes the show all the more special because you sort of love and appreciate their passion. Definitely. So one of the things that I got to do this year was at the time when, when I had to do it, it was writing an article. Uh, Jonathan Wilkins had asked me to write an article about fangirls in star Wars. And you're trying to write an article that, it's in a magazine and maybe a lot of people won't read it or maybe they'll skim past it. But if they do read it, you want to make an impression. And so I wrote this article in the Star Wars Insider and it was about fangirls. I'm catching up on all life and reading the latest issue of Star Wars Insider and I open up to the letters page and it's all letters in reaction to this article just saying thank you for talking about the women and strong role models in Star Wars and you know one lady says Claudia from New York that she loves Princess Leia and Carolyn just talks about girl power and there was a young young gentleman who he wrote in well Star Wars Insider has really made me rethink my attitudes to the saga I always thought Star Wars was a guy thing that some girls like and I was wrong he just went on and talked about the stereotypes and it made him reconsider and he's ready to enjoy the fandom with everybody. And I read, I read that and it, I started crying. It's a stupid thing. I wrote, <laughs> wrote a little article, but it, it meant a lot to me and it was fun to see there were ladies at geek girl con, which I had mentioned in the article who came and said they really appreciated it. And some of the, what I call the, our geek elders who the people Maggie Nolikoska was the lady who I interviewed for the piece. She uh, said she was really impressed and her friends were really impressed and they were the first Star Wars fans for 1977. So it was a highlight of my year. Oh, I know. And my name was in it. it yes, was it so is. Cool. So another thing for me was that I was asked by Ashley Eckstein to work the Her Universe um, booth at Star Wars Weekends, and it was an honor and a pleasure to help her. And I didn't expect anything going in. I was just super excited to wear my Her Universe clothes and buy the new stuff and get to see all of the amazing you know fangirls that came by that wanted to get it. And it was a great experience overall, just getting to spend the day with David and Ashley, you know, when she was able to be there and getting to see her do her signings every day and then just getting to interact with the fans. That was the best part, getting to help them find clothes that fit them and, you know, show them different ways to wear the different clothes that came out for Star Wars weekends and getting to help little girls and, you know, the little girls that wanted the Ewok tank, but it was too big for them because they were too short. So we made it into a dress. You know, just really cool little things like that and just having that opportunity. I hope, fingers crossed, that for the next Star Wars weekend that she asked me to help her again because it was a blast. And Teresa was keeping the stuff because it was flying off the rack. Every time I went by, Teresa was just like filling them back up because there's so much amazing stuff and everybody wants it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It was crazy. My other really favorite, favorite moment was from Star Wars Weekends, and that was the Rebel Force Radio meetup because it was insane. We just meeting all those people and just talking about experiences and then 
you know, James Arnold Taylor walking by and he's like, oh man, it's Rebel Force Radio. And he just came over and just started talking. <laughs> and you could tell he was right in his element. And the whole, everything was so fantastic that that day. There are so many things that you can't even, Teresa and I were trying to catch up afterwards and trying to remember everything. She remembered pieces and I remember pieces and it was all overwhelming, but it was so amazing. It really was. Still on the Star Wars weekend kick, that actually gave me my third thing that was one of my really big things to share is that I co-wrote a piece with Trisha on the official StarWars.com blog about tips and tricks for Star Wars weekends. I'm just so excited because I have something on the StarWars.com blog. I'm like, yeah, accomplishment. It's one thing, and it was a co-write. And who knows if I'll ever do it again, but look at me. <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome to see it out there. I have screen caps of every time my article went up on. I save pictures. It's, you know, a little moment when you're up there, but it's like, wow, that's really awesome. It's so cool. <laughs> I have something that came out of my fandom that I can't tell anybody about yet but I can tell you that it will be really exciting and it it would be at the top of my list I would tell everybody what it is but stay tuned because you will know when I get to say what it is so that's my thing <laughs> awesome no idea what to do with that <laughs> It's my, I like to do cryptic tweets every once in a while. And then people, all, it's funny, I do a cryptic tweet and everybody answers back. They're like, well, what is it? You pull so, her, or her universe where she like shows like part of a piece of clothes. Exactly. I love when Ashley does that. <laughs> it's like, or she'll just be like, oh, I'm at a meeting. And you'll be like, what? Because <laughs> she has something on. Right. Her, yeah. <laughs> Hi, this is Trisha breaking in real quick. After we recorded, some news broke and I can actually share my little thing, my little secret, thanks to Rebels Report's tweet about the Ultimate Star Wars Guide coming May 5th of next year, written by Ryder Wyndham, author Adam Bray, Dan Wallace, and Trisha Barr. So look forward to it. It's your definitive guide to the Star Wars universe coming next year. few things that um, we're proud of that we accomplished with the show. One of the things we're proud of is that we've gotten some amazing interviews that have completely blown my mind that I didn't know that we would get them or never dreamed we would get them. And, you know, it's really awesome because it tells me that the people that we've gotten to be on the show really care about what we're doing and they're excited to be on the show. I mean, Mary Franklin, Claire Grant, Kat Tabor, Greg Wiseman, which you'll hear in this episode, actually. Every interview is blowing my mind and people, you know, it's so much fun to bring, to ask the questions and to hear them answer and genuinely excited. I love it. And the interviews just, spur on the ways that we engage, which is the next thing on our list, engage fans of all ages and all genders, because it's so awesome to hear the people being interviewed talk about when they were a kid or just being, you know, we ask people about being a fangirl and we even ask her male guests about being a fangirl. So, and it's always interesting because, you know, sometimes you're like, hmm, and then they sort of engage it and just have fun with it. It's so much fun that we've been there. And you know what else I didn't put on this list and I realized that right now we started the fangirl flail. Oh, yes. I'm so proud of that. We did. Hashtag (laughs) fangirl flail. And 10 years from now, no one will probably remember where it came from. But when I, especially when I see our fellow fanboys doing fangirl flail, I love it because they sort of, they, they realize that sometimes they do act goofy like we fangirls can, but it's all in fun. So however you want to be excited, I wish they like stars.com could like monitor people's reaction just say okay we're gonna follow you for five days and they'll release some news and see how people just like fall around and <laughs> flail around when they see something but you so. know what's hard with that when you hashtag fangirl flail sometimes you also hashtag fangirl fail and they're very close <laughs> <laughs> I, 
probably had a few of those too, like trying to t- tweet and walk at Star Wars weekend. And girl so. fail. And also with the engaging fans of all ages and genders thing, I mean, it's cool to know that our listening audience is guys and girls, all ages, original trilogy, prequel trilogy, Clone Wars, kids, you know, fan kids, like there's so many people listening to the show and I'm so glad when they leave us comments on Twitter or Facebook or whatever the right words are for all of our twit face stuff. But just that there, we've got such a broad listener base. It's really awesome. And then I'm really proud of the fact that we have kept at least one segment from the first show in every show. And that's been our character discussions. We've talked about so many well, so many. I say so many. Um, we've talked about twelve specifically. Well, there's more than there's been more than one in some of them. So in the characters, so oh, our just droid. droid. <laughs> the Millennium Falcon has three brains. Let's just remember that she's three brains, not one. So she's an uber smart ship. So just to kind of recap, we've talked Boba Fett, Ayla Secura, Millennium Falcon, Asajj Ventress, Yoda, Hera, Syndulla, Darth Maul, the Jedi Order as a whole, Mother Talzin, Chewbacca, the droids, and Ahsoka. So we've covered the gamut on some really cool character discussions. So I'm really glad that we've done that. Some people didn't even think of the Millennium Falcon as a ship until we talked about it. I mean, as a character? As a character. I mean, well, yes. <laughs> And that's what happens when I talk too fast. Here's my sticky note. Slow down. Slow down. Sure. There you go. <laughs> so while we're slowing down, we're going to let the Force cast ramp up. Hey there, fangirls going rogue. This is Eric Geller. Eric Blythe. And Justin Bolger. And we are here from the Force cast to say congratulations. We just want to thank you for everything you do for the Star Wars community. You guys have a great show. And congratulations on your anniversary. Absolutely. Enjoy your show and looking forward to many more years to come. We'll see you at Celebration. May the Force be with you. Well, thank you, Eric, Eric, and Justin for the awesome birthday message. We really appreciate it. You guys rock. Definitely. We we want to see more women interacting on social medias and promoting each other. So that's a goal I keep hoping and that, you know, every day we can support um, our fellow female fans and highlight what they're doing and sort of create this awesome network. So that's one of the ways to promote women in the world. Yeah. And one of the things is that we really want our female audience to kind of interact with us more because we hear a lot from our male listeners, but you know, we don't get that many either voicemails or emails or comments and stuff on our Facebook page or Twitter from our female listeners. And we know you're out there and we know you're busy because we're busy too. But we really want to hear from you guys because we do this show for everybody, but we definitely do it for you. We want to hear from you more. So that's one of our goals. I'd like to see that kind of go up. Also, I really want to get our Facebook likes and our Twitter followers over a thousand over the next year. I think we can do it. We could do it. We can definitely do it. We're a a little over 700 now for our Facebook page. So it seems like sometimes like, wow, you see a lot of pages with a lot of likes, but we're doing it without promotion. We're just doing it through our own little network and um, getting out there and interacting with people. So, Mm -hmm. and we have about 710 followers on Twitter. So we're about in the same place on Facebook and Twitter, but we'd love to get pushed over that 1000 mark. I don't know why. I just think it'd be really cool. It would be. I can tell you that when I went over a thousand on my, it was like, yeah. And I don't know what you're at now. I'm at like 1800 or whatever. And I'm like, Oh my God. Close to two thousand. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little over four thousand. So oh, now okay. I have well, long, yeah, I have a long whatever. way to go. To. <laughs> the one thing I've learned: the more followers you get, and just following more people, because I try to follow most people back. I always check and see what their their Twitter stream is before I follow them back. But then you have to use lists and whatnot to manage. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it would be overwhelming. But some days I just roam through all my followers. But if I really need to, you know, check on what people are saying, I have to manage them through lists. Yeah, so. you're going to have to teach me about that. I still don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And our last possible goal 
it is out there. It is something we're considering. It is something we'll probably beta test um, is to take the show live. So when we record it, we'll record it live. There is a website. If you listen to my other shows that I do with Steve Glosson, it's called Mixler.com. And so we're considering taking the show live. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, and if you guys want that, let us know. If you you would definitely pop in and listen and have fun and do a chat, yeah, and we want to go. The chat, yeah, that'd be really cool. We'd love to yeah. we'd love to interact live with our listening audience. We got a cool message. Uh, we've had some really cool birthday messages the whole show. This is a pretty cool one. So take a listen, and then we'll let you know who it was. Well, he'll let you know. <laughs> This is Rumor Control, here are the facts. Hey, this is Bobby Roberts from the Full of Sith podcast. It's November 2013, and I've been hearing some things through the spoiler grapevine, which is why you're listening. Spoilers out there, you come to me for whatever reason. It's not like I actually know anything. I just read all the same crap you read. Anyway, apparently... There's this new show called Fangirls Going Rogue that's supposed to be dropping here pretty soon. And I've heard from multiple sources about what's going on with this thing. Okay, now, firstly, I haven't confirmed this yet, but it sounds pretty solid that it's going to have Trisha Barr and Teresa Delgado hosting it, which is like... (laughs) That's a good call. I mean, I know the know-it-alls on the message boards were all like, but but what about, like, Benedict Cumberbatch or Idris Elba? And I'm like, guys, they can't play everybody. You can't just be like, Han Solo, Idris Elba, Chewbacca, Benedict Cumberbatch, Princess Leia, Benedict Elba, Teresa Delgado, Idris Cumberbatch, Trisha Barr, Idridict Elba Batch. Okay, just knock it off, all right? They're good, but they're not that good. Although, honestly, I'm pretty sure... Idris Elba could play Benedict Cumberbatch. Absolutely. Plus, I'm also hearing there's word of production art leaking out. I haven't seen it yet, but I've gotten quite a few in-depth descriptions of this production art that shows Teresa and Trisha as the fangirls going rogue, not only making it to their first anniversary, but being one of the single best Star Wars podcasts in the entire damn galaxy. Plus, and get this, they're apparently wielding purple and pink lightsabers. Although I guess that detail came straight from like the IMDB message boards. Some guy named Hog Squaddle apparently has pics, <laughs> but he's not sharing them because he says he needs more likes on his Facebook page. I'm pretty sure it's all just going to end up in making StarWars.net by the end of the month anyway. So anyway, if everything's going the way that I'm hearing it, by the time December 2014 rolls around, it'll have been a year of wonderful podcasts from two wonderful women lending one of the most important perspectives to our goofy little fandom as it is today. Now, this is Bobby Roberts. That was Rumor Control. Teresa and Trisha are awesome. Those are the facts. I just have to say that when this came through on my email, this was like a long day. I had a long day and this made my day. So thank you, Bobby, for going through that. It's amazing. It really is. So, Trisha, we have somebody here with us now for a little bit of the show. And um, I just thought I'd tell you that I decided, even though I said it earlier, that I was going to bring Greg Wiseman on the show today. Welcome, Greg, to Fangirls Going Rogue. We're so excited to have you. Thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here. Well, Greg, just so you know, when we bring um, our friends or fanboys in the force onto the show, we get to give you the title of being an honorary fangirl. So um, we always ask a question of what does it mean for you to be a fangirl when we ask it to the ladies? But I guess now for you, what would it mean to you to be an honorary fangirl? Uh, well, uh, I'm honored to be an honorary, I guess. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, I love writing female characters. You know, my first 
professional assignment at DC Comics that wasn't um, purely sort of an original thing was doing a Black Canary miniseries for DC Comics. It never got published, but I was really proud of the ideas behind it. Um, years later, I reread the scripts, and, and they're a little cringeworthy because I was 19 when I was writing it. But um, but I I still think the ideas behind it were great. And I, you know, I just love female characters, and I do think they get short shrift overall, and I try and compensate for that at least to the extent I'm able um, and create some more balance in a world where, you know, there are always executives telling me, no, this show is about boys, for boys and boys only. And my response is, depending on my mood, is to argue the point or to nod and ignore them. And both methods work. So, you know, I'm happy to be a fangirl. <laughs> well, we're happy to have well, you. This is fantastic. We we like to challenge our guests straight off the bat. So, you know, we informed you that you were a fangirl and asked you how you felt about it. Uh, but how in really the, the scope of that question is really to ask people also how what being a fan of and our particular particularly for our show, Star Wars has meant to you. Uh, and I think you have a you probably have a, a long um, memory on being a fan. But do you remember your first moments and how it made you feel? Oh, yeah. I mean, I was 13. It was the first weekend that a movie called Star Wars. I mean, now we call it Episode Four, A New Hope. But back then we just called it Star Wars um, came out and I made my mom take me. Uh, I lived in the San Fernando Valley, and I made my mom take me all the way to Westwood so I could see this movie. I have no memory of how I heard about it or why I was so excited and determined to see it. That I don't remember. Like, I'm sure there must have been some promotion that, that got me excited, but I can't remember what it was, really. But what I remember very clearly is waiting in line in Westwood with my mom to get in and see that movie uh, during the day, you know, um, the very first weekend, and then seeing it and just being blown away by it, loving it. And, you know, this was back before people, I mean, let alone the Internet or DVRs or DVDs. I mean, we didn't even have, I mean, very few households had VCRs back then. And we didn't have one. That movie was seminal. And then, you know, a few years later, I was... 15 or 16 by that point, I, uh, an empire came back, came out, I mean, and, uh, you know, I loved that one even more. And those two movies are still sort of, for me, the core of what Star Wars is about. See, as, as Teresa likes to remind me, I'm, I'm, I'm very close to that memory, just a couple years off an age. Uh, I was eight when the movie came out, so... The Star Wars. I say Star Wars, and I mean Episode Four. And I sometimes have to catch myself. So uh, I do that so. out of love because <laughs> I wasn't born. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I love hearing it because it's sort of like reliving my youth. Same experience for me. So uh, you know, it's fantastic. Just having gone through Halloween, I cosplayed. I didn't know that's what I was doing, Princess Leia, on in. Um, the first Halloween after the movie. So it's like one of those crazy things. I love hearing those type of memories. Uh, but Teresa is from a different generation. What I think it's neat to hear how everybody came into the fandom of Star Wars because it can, it, you can come into it so many different ways. To be fair, when I saw Revenge of the Sith in the theaters, I was wearing a Wicket shirt. So I was repping. Okay. <laughs> I was repping original trilogy as a 20-year-old. <laughs> okay, Greg. So one of the things we also like to ask people is, what is something from Star Wars that you feel is underrated or underappreciated? The, the things that, that strike me, and, and again, I don't necessarily think that people don't um, rate it, but, you know, I'm a big Chewbacca fan. So, and what I like about the dynamic is uh, aboard the Millennium Falcon is it's got this great Robin Hood feel to me. Um, 
you know, we talk about the samurai influences and the, and all sorts of, uh, you know, the Buddhist influences and all sorts of influences to the film. But I also, even as a kid, got this huge Robin Hood influence, you know, with Han sort of as Robin Hood and, um, and Chewie as, as little John. And then you had, you know, these other people coming aboard, you know, including, you know, Friar Tuck and, and, and all these people. And I, I definitely got this sort of band of merry men, so to speak, um, with Princess Leia as Maid Marian. Um, and this feel of we've got to stop the evil Prince John and the wicked Sheriff of Nottingham i.e. the Emperor and, and Darth. I don't know, if, you know, maybe people have talked about the Robin Hood influence on Star Wars for, for 30 years, and I'm just unaware of it, but that's not something that always sort of struck me. I've never heard of that before, so no, good job. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. I was like, wow, that's really profound, and now you said it, I can totally see it. That's and, awesome. and you should go on Teresa's Disney podcast to talk about <laughs> Robin Hood now. <laughs> that is really cool, though, because By the Robin- way, though, I, I, I should say I see Robin Hood everywhere. Like I go to or at least I used to go to uh, Springsteen concerts and I and it, it felt like Robin Hood to me. You know, it was Clarence Clemens with Little John and and Will Scarlet was uh, uh, Miami Steve and, and Bruce with Robin Hood and and, um, uh, you know, Maid Marian was there and it just is. I've always thought that Springsteen concerts were like the musical version of Robin Hood. When I was really little, way before Star Wars, there was a TV show on called Rocket Robin Hood, which was basically just, they took the Robin Hood legend and and just redid it as a science fiction story. And I have the feeling that if I saw it now, it would be pretty cringeworthy. Um, But the idea behind it, I adored, you know, and I still think it was sort of brilliant. That's actually pretty cool. And there's been a couple of Robin Hood things that have come up in pop culture and Trisha. Yeah, I know we're way off, but I don't really care because I love Robin Hood. Um, Robin Hood has made appearances on Once Upon a Time on ABC. And um, Will Scarlet is now in the show. And then um, also, oh, what was the other thing? There was something else that Robin Hood, oh, then one of the episodes of Doctor Who this season He's in with the new doctor is based yeah. in um, on Robin Hood, and I thought it was a great episode. So, yeah, I thought it was fun. I've you know read a lot of uh, what you've said, and I follow you on Twitter, and you you talk about diversity. You mentioned it right in you know the beginning of of our discussion, and part of what uh, my blog does, Fangirl, is we focus on the feminist critiques of pop culture storytelling and what our team does of contributors is when we have a new star Wars creator coming in, we'll go out and find all their works and really sit down and see what their, um, how they've co- approached stories previously. So we can, you know, get an idea of what your approach is and not all of my contributors have seen everything you've done. We've all went to different places. Like an editor, uh, read your novel and saw it. we had a couple of the shows you've worked on and we all sort of agreed when we were talking that you don't just create diversity for diversity's sake um that all your female characters have agency and com- competency and they really avoid some of the pitfalls where you see negative tropes kind of working into um that hurt the female character sometimes when they're just put in because someone said you need to put in a female character one of the ones that comes to mind and you you didn't write the movie of the week for star wars rebels but what comes to mind to me is it's really subtle in that Hera and sabine come off right away as the the two characters who are competent who don't really goof up in the beginning and that establishes them immediately as characters that know what they're doing that's very much in the vein of how princess leia appeared in episode four star wars and then later on i got to see that sabine is also beautiful that ezra might think she's cute when you are looking at this like do you think that's sort of like how the characters are being created before you even start writing them that that comes off is it something that you you're thinking about as you're creating a new show like rebels can you just like talk a little bit about the process that goes through your head sure first thing i should say just to be clear is when i came aboard rebels the lead characters had all been created by um 
Simon Kinberg and Dave Filoni. So um, I do like to think I helped with Sabine and Hera, but I don't want to pretend that I created them in any way. They were there. But um, among the things that um, I tried to get everyone to focus on when I, they brought me aboard is, and not just for Sabine and Hera, but for um, Zeb and Ezra and Kanan uh, as well, was it was like, okay, we need to know what the, the backstories are. Um, and, and for some of them, some of it's more obvious than others. I mean, again, Sabine was sorry Mandalorian when I came aboard. Obviously, um, Hera was a Twi'lek, or if you're from the Southern Hemisphere, Twi'lek. But that was a joke. No, I got no laugh there at all. <laughs> no, I actually, but, um, I was thinking about it actually very intently going, is that really the difference? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we decided in the room. Um, that day, actually, the first day I started there, we did, you know, there was an argument about whether it was Twilight or Twilight, and we decided that it depended which hemisphere you were from. <laughs> That's I, awesome. Um, you know, for example, Sabine and Hera didn't have last names when I came aboard. Neither did Zeb or Kanan or Ezra, for that matter. But one of the things I said, and, and again, I think the, the key thing is that it, it's easy for me because the, the name of this podcast to focus on Sabine and Hera, but the fact of the matter is, is that, and maybe if I'm not being too arrogant, what makes me a little bit different is that I don't treat those characters any different than I do the other three guys, you know? So I went in and I said, they need last names, not the guys need last names, or not even the girls need last names. All five of them need last names because in the Star Wars universe, people have last names. There's certainly, you know, pop culture properties where certain characters don't have last names. You don't go to Asgard and go, what's Thor's last name? Well, if you think about it, I guess it's Odin's son or something like that. But no one asks that question. But we all all know that Luke's last name is Skywalker. We all know that Leia's last name is Organa. We know that Han's last name is Solo. And so these guys need his last names. Um, And I came up with a couple of them. I think I came up with Aurelio's. Um, for Zeb, I, I know I came up with his first name, Gareth Zeb. In other words, his name was Zeb, and I was like, well, that's, you know, the nickname. But And I don't think I came up with Sabine's last name, and we had long discussions about Harris and what it meant in terms of her background and everything like that. The point was, is one of the things I tried to focus them on is, look, what we need here for all these characters is last names, backstories, who are they related to, who are they, you know, where do they come from, and the purpose behind that for all five of them is that when we set, sit down to write them, when our actors sit down to, to read those parts, we, you know, we had a big download with, with five lead actors about their characters is that in order to do the job right, we have to know, we have to know much more than we're willing or ready to reveal. It's not a, you know, the fact is Sabine has a history and we're not ready to reveal it in season one. We're not. We have plans, but we're not going to reveal it in season one. But we need to know it. Those of us working on the show need need to know it because otherwise, how do we write that character? How does Tia play that character? If she doesn't know where she's coming from, if I don't know where Sabine is coming from. And I think the key thing is, is that I don't see, at least not automatically, that sort of differentiation between what you do to develop a male character and a female character to the point where at one point I was suggesting something in a story, the other people in the room saying that doesn't pass the Bechdel test. <laughs> and I was just like, I don't, I don't, I don't care. It makes sense to me that they be talking about the guys in the scene. I understand in a big picture sense why that test matters. I do. Um, because in the grand scheme of things, but what I'm trying to do is write characters who are real. And I got my guys talking about the girls. So why can't I have my girl talking about the guys? Because the fact is, and it's a fact, girls sometimes do talk about guys. Just like it's a fact that guys sometimes do talk about girls. Now, I understand from a percentage basis why all we see on television ever is the only time two girls have a conversation that's about the guys. And that's pretty awful. And I get it. But my point is, is I'm not writing those characters that way in the first place. They got all sorts of things to talk about, but I don't want to be afraid now to uh, have them talk about the guys. Um, and and fear and trying to overcome that kind of fear, 
um, is something I learned pretty early on. Like when we were uh, creating gargoyles, if I can jump back 20 years, originally our trio consisted of uh, two, fe- uh, two male and one female gargoyles. The female was this heavy set female gargoyle. At the time, someone, I don't remember who, raised the issue, do we really want our one good female gargoyle, because the other female gargoyle on the show was Demona, who was the big villain, um, to be heavy, younger then. And I thought, oh, gee, maybe you're right. Maybe that's no good. So we changed that character to male. And it's not that I regret it, because that character, Broadway, became a fantastic character. And we brought other characters in later that I think compensated for that lack of courage in that moment. But it is still, you know, something like back on and go, okay, I chickened out there. Greg, when you have a script writer um, and you're looking at the story that they've developed and you see maybe potential problems with the portrayal of a female character, what would be some advice that you would give your colleagues to maybe help fix, you know, the character? You know, a lot depends on what my role is on a given show. You know, am I producing this show? Am I uh, story editing? Am I just a freelance writer who's, you know, a hired gun in essence for a particular story? If I'm just some guy on the side giving advice, uh, you know, part of the thinking for me is that, you know, you've got to be up to date. Like there were certain things that we did in the 90s to create balance that even now, you look back on it and go, okay, we were well-intentioned, but it's dated. So, for example, you know, sometimes I got on properties where they're like, um, there are no women in the cast, or there's the one woman in the cast, and and, uh, and she's not given anything to do. And I'm like, you haven't made this character real yet. But it's hard to answer that in a vacuum, because you've got to kind of, look at the specifics of any given thing and sort of go, okay, what can we do to flesh this character out and make her as interesting and as potent as any of the male characters in the show? Well, then maybe like more direct, I guess, like maybe towards Rebels. Is there anything that you can think of that you maybe did to kind of help shape Hera and Sabine a little bit more so that they were portrayed in the right way and maybe had a little bit more focus? Well, I don't want to make it sound like I was like, the, the voice in the wilderness on Star Wars. I mean, you know, I'm working with um, Simon and Dave, who are both pretty bright and enlightened guys. And Dave was one of the co-creators of Ahsoka, who's a pretty fantastic character, I think, anyway. Simon's written a bunch of great women in multiple movies. You know, it wasn't like I was had some battle there. Plus, you know, Lucasfilm Story Group has a lot of great, powerful women in there. Carrie Hart, Carrie Beck. Rain Roberts, um, all of whom were in all of our story meetings. You know, when we're talking specifically about Rebels, it's kind of ridiculous to view me as like, uh, oh, thank God Greg was there, because that's just not true. <laughs> uh, we, we definitely, we're big, huge fans of Dave Filoni and Simon Kimberg on their own and what they've done with female characters. So definitely that's not the angle. Um, obviously, but everybody I, I guess- I guess I'd be back to repeating what I said before, which is you know, the thing I, the focus I tried to bring to it was that, and again, it was the same focus for the male characters was just, we need to know who these people are prior to meeting them for the first time. Everything starts well with those little shorts, but other than that, that the spark of rebellion when Ezra meets these people for the first time. Great. And Ezra's our lead. I mean, it's an ensemble show, but Ezra's our point of view character. He's the guy who's never been in outer space before, has never really fought the Empire before, um, didn't have a full awareness of, I mean, he hated the Empire, but didn't have a full awareness of just how bad the Empire was. Kane and Zeb, Karen, Sabine, they're all supposed to be relatively equal in a very close second place, let me put it that way. I'm, I'm going to just I'm going to offer my out my outside looking in because what you're saying makes sense to me as an observer of storytelling is that a lot of times that your point of view character is for some storytellers is the main focus and they build everything around that character. And it's and a lot of times that the other characters in the story don't get as much of an effort at building them. A lot of times the main character ends up being the gravity that moves 
the story as opposed to what you're talking about is giving all the characters essentially a gravity that interacts with Ezra's. Gravity is a great metaphor. I mean, truly, because that's what you want to build. You want to build character dynamics. It's not just about building characters. It's about building what is the dynamic between these two characters, between any two characters. You've got to show with two characters, between them. You've got to show with 20 characters. I need to know the dynamic between, you know, you need a flow chart, you know, because you need to know the dynamic between character one and character 13 and character one and character 18 and character one and character 20 and likewise character two and character 36 or whatever, because gravity is it exactly. You need each of these characters um, again, irrespective of maleness or femaleness, every single one needs to have his or her own gravity. And that means backstory. That means history. That means, you know, yeah, a last name. We appreciate that Zeb has a full name because there's nothing that makes me laugh more than Hera saying his full name. Like he's in big trouble. No, I do. I love that. That's so great. Obviously, you have these this great team, which when you're in there, and I know as an individual creating stories, it's always fun to create stories, but I really enjoy over the years creating stories with other people. Does that, being in a room with that many great minds, kind of elevate your game, We're bouncing off each other, getting ideas? Oh, definitely. I mean, the process I use, which we used on Rob Bolt, is about a giant bulletin board, a lot of index cards push pins and sharpies. It's very low tech <laughs> because I'm very low tech, <laughs> but it's about get an idea for a character. You jot it on a card. You get an idea for a piece of dialogue. You jot it on a card. You get a story beat. You put it on a card and then you start. I mean, we built the whole season. You know, we didn't build an episode at the time I and mean, we did, but the point wasn't to build an episode, then go off and write the script for that episode and then go and build another one. We built the whole season on that bulletin board before we turned anything into anybody. And again, we had Pablo Hidalgo in the room. We had uh, me, Dave, and Simon. We had Kiri Rain. Uh, Kiri and Rain were there. But, you know, we had a bunch of people in the room, and we're all building off ideas. And we put a card down. We go, no, no, no let's save that for episode three. So we moved that down. <laughs> and then, you know, and we, and we got another card that's down in episode six, and it's like, you know, the audience is just not going to understand why this matters to her. All right, move that one up to episode, you know, four or something like that. And you're building this and you're talking it through and you're coming up with ideas and someone will have an idea and that'll be great. And then someone else might come up with a better idea. And, and we switch to that. The, the, the hope is, is that the best idea wins. And I always go back to what, I don't even know if this is true, but I've heard it often enough that I want to believe it even if it isn't true. But they used to say that when Michelangelo looked at a block of marble, what he would say, I'm told, that he could see the statue inside the marble and that he felt his job was relatively easy. All he had to do was chip away the excess. To me, I... what creating stories is about. It's about the story exists. It's there. All I have to do is find it. And when things are working, the characters start to tell you what the, where the story is going to go next because you know those characters well enough to know how they'd react in a given situation. All you need to do often is create the smallest springboard, and suddenly you know what's going to happen. I'm yeah, actually far, feel, far away. I'm feeling a kindred spirit because that's how I've described creating my own novel, and I'll do my shameless plug for it here, Wind, that I it was there. The story was always there. I just found it, and I had to wait for it to for me to see every piece. So when you're describing that, that's sort of like weird because it's exactly – the process I go through in writing for me for storytelling. But what I've noticed on Twitter is you have, you have novels out there, reign of ghosts and spirits of ash and fallen, right? A couple of uh, my contributors have read them and they really like them. Can you tell us a little bit? Cause I, I watch you, you like you have a schedule. You tell people what you're working on. Is there like, do you have an outline? Do you know what you're going to write? Do you know I need to write a certain amount of, words a day for your prose writing or how do you do that? Cause it's, I'm curious just watching. I'm impressed by the volume that you're able to produce. That's one of us from a volume standpoint. I'm not, <laughs> uh, it takes a long time. I mean, I, uh, 
Reign of the Ghost, the first book, I actually wrote the first draft uh, of something like 14 years ago. Spirits, which is the second novel, I'm, I have a very clear memory of how I went about writing that book, did it while I was one of the executive producers of the first season of Rebels. I was doing it toward the end. I, those two projects completely overlapped. My process on, on Spirits is exactly what I described. I It was a giant consultant board and a lot of index cards. In fact, there were so many index cards, 693 by the time I was done, that it did didn't fit on this giant six foot tall bulletin board. And I started laying them out on this table I have in my office and it still didn't fit. So I began to lay them out on the pool table. Um, so by the time I was done, I had index cards completely covering top to bottom, no inch of space on the bulletin board, the table and the pool table. When I was done, when I felt like, yes, this is the story just the way I just discussed, and I felt like it was right. I then take those index cards, collect them all together, and I write them up into a document. Spent eight months actually writing the book, mostly what I outlined. But there were a couple characters who decided as I was writing the book that they weren't being given enough screen time or page time or whatever you want to call it. You have to be open to that. You know, you may have made all these plans, but if the characters are telling you uh, something different, you got to listen. So there were two characters who I considered to be extremely minor characters when I outlined the book. And suddenly I realized that they weren't minor characters, that they had significant contributions to make, but it also meant I had to pay them off in one way or another in the book. And so, and I'm doing that more or less on the fly, all while I'm simultaneously um, writing and story editing scripts for uh, Rebels. Now, on the one hand, um, it definitely slowed things down. You know, I wasn't working full time on the book anymore, but it was also kind of great because, uh, you know, most of my career has been about collaboration. But the truth is, is that every once in a while, you're compromising your vision. You may have an idea that you kind of really like that someone else isn't wild about, whether it's the network or the studio or one of your partners. It's a process, so sometimes you have to let things go that you didn't really want to let go. And what's great about the novel is I don't have to worry about the length. It could be as long as I wanted it to be or as short as I wanted. And I don't have to compromise at all. And there's something really scary about that, as I'm sure you know, because <laughs> you can't count on anyone else. I don't have a composer who I know is going to create a mood. I have to do that with the words. I don't have phenomenal actors who are going to take dialogue that's decent, but not necessarily stellar, and they're going to make it stellar. Now, I've got to make sure the dialogue actually is stellar in the first place. I don't have artists literally painting the world. Um, I have to paint the world with words. One of the things that really caught me off guard in doing the second book, because these are two books in a nine-book series, is that having found in the first book what I thought was like the perfect way to describe a location or one of my characters... I then had to describe that location and those characters again. But I couldn't just use the same language I used in the previous book. I had to find another second perfect way to describe it, which, by the way, <laughs> is really annoying. Because, you know, if I'm doing a cartoon and I have Superboy in the cartoon, the next time Superboy shows up, I don't have to describe him. He just shows up. We'll also include uh, Jonah Marie, who contributes to Teresa's site, Fangirl Next Door, wrote a fabulous review of your book. So we'll share that for people to, they want to get a little more insight from a reader's perspective. But yeah, um, I like your def- reviews, so definitely share those. Greg, thank you so much for the time, and we really appreciate it. And we're glad to have you in our small but growing group of honorary fangirls. Yeah, we look forward to more stuff that you're doing, so just drop us a line when you've got new stuff you want us to tell people about. Sure, I appreciate that. Thank you. So we were just so happy that we, we've we had that opportunity to talk to Greg. He um He's such a great guy, wouldn't you say? Yes, he's smart and enthusiastic, and I love pretty much everything I've ever seen from him. So yeah. there you go. Yeah, so it was, it was super fun to talk to him. I'm glad we got to have him on the show today. So we have a little message that we received for our birthday, and I'm not really sure how I feel about this one. Without further ado, the Star Wars Report. 
Hey, this is Riley. And this is Bethany. From the Star Wars Report Podcast, and we're here to wish a very happy one-year anniversary to Fangirls Going Rogue. And Bethany, I heard something. Yes? Uh, I heard the real reason why Teresa absolutely despises Mace Windu. And what's that? Party pooper. Party pooper. This party's over. Now is not the time for this. Take a seat. No, I don't trust him. Not yet. They had a good long discussion about the reason I don't really like Mace Windu is because he has a purple lightsaber and I'm jealous. (laughs) Not really sure how I feel about that. (laughs) When somebody has a pink lightsaber and I'm jealous, I'll I'll understand. (laughs) I'm not jealous that he is... uh, Whatever. That's a whole... (laughs) a whole another day. So let's get into something here. This episode is coming out right before the holiday season is really getting started. And everybody's going to start doing their holiday Christmas shopping and all kinds of stuff. And so we thought it would be fantastic to come up with a list of some things that you can put on your wish list or things you can get for you, the Star Wars fan in your life. It's the fun segment. It's the toy segment. So <laughs> Teresa, we're just going to run through these. We're going to give you ideas and and tell you where to find them and if you want to put them on your wish list or if you want to get them for somebody we are going to help your Christmas shopping yep. either way. So one of my first things is um, the Lego Star Wars Advent Calendar for 2015. Well, 2014, 2015. This Advent Calendar is awesome and you should just get it and then just do it all through the month of December because you get to open up a little window every day leading up to Christmas Day and there's a tiny little bag in there that has a small Lego set to put together. Also, the Star Wars Lego sets I am most looking forward to getting, fingers crossed, legs crossed, all those kind of things, is the Ghost, the Phantom, and the Ewok Village. Wow. (laughs) Sometimes it's like Lego overload when you go into store because you can't even pick, but those are some awesome picks. Really, if you want to just go onto a a one site that has cool stuff that you can give to your Star Wars fan or that you can ask for that you can kind of incorporate into your just everyday life is Think Geek. They have the new R2-D2 USB car charger. It's not that new, but it's new. It's not everybody has it. It's definitely a cool item that you could just be in your car with the most awesome car charger. So, And also the R2-D2 measuring cups, which I got from from thinking and they're crazy awesome i will cook all the time now a bake whatever i just want to use them it's it's really awesome and they have all sorts of other cool things like the lightsaber chopstick so you can eat your food with chopsticks in style no need for forks if you're a jedi you could levitate and pretend like you're using the chopsticks which is what i do <laughs> There's also some really cool stuff coming out from her universe for the holiday season. Um, Every year she does a holiday pin that's a collector's pin, usually for Cyber Monday. And this year it's actually going to be Boba Fett. Um, If you want to hear some more about some of the stuff that she's bringing out, go over and listen to um, my Disney show, Disney Vault Talk. And it'll be the episode about Alice in Wonderland. And she talks a little bit about that stuff there. But there is also a Star Wars Infinity Scarf that is out. Star Wars Rebels shirts are amazing and they have them for women and girls so those are really cool there's a star wars cardigan coming out for the holiday season it's not out yet but it will be probably a cyber monday item and then there's the new darth vader jewelry line from the sparkle factory from her universe go and check all that out it's all amazing my friend shay standifer who was celebration artist at celebration europe She does custom Star Wars names, and what she does is she makes each letter of your name or your child's name or your friend's name a character from Star Wars. So they're, you know, they're little characters. For me, she did the T, the R, I, C, I, A, and she made actually one of the eyes was Jagged Fell and a little Jaina Solo, and I had a little R2-D2, and so you can go, she's doing these for the holidays, she put, she can do them very quickly and get them ready, but there, it's a unique custom gift that nobody would have, it'd be their own name, and or you could get whatever you wanted, fangirl, so it's shaystandiferstorenv.com, we will provide a link and a picture so you can see what they look like, and you can also contact her through Facebook, and that's Shay Standifer as well. So it's S 
H E A is how you spell Shay. Cool. Also, there's a new version of Star Wars Operation, the whole game where you go and you get the little, you know, funny bone out and all that kind of stuff. Only you're getting the little pieces out of R two D two, and they have had a version of Star Wars Operation before, but there's a brand new one out. You can find it at any like Toys R Us or Walmart or whatever. Also, Cardamundi USA has the story of Darth Vader playing card set, and it actually comes in the plastic Darth Vader helmet. And then the deck of cards actually takes you through the story of Darth Vader's entire life, from him as a child to him being Darth Vader. Teresa came up with most of this list, and she's like, well, you didn't really add much. I'm like, because everything on it I want. She had the Journeys exclusive Vans Star Wars Galaxy fighter skeet shoe, and Vans has some awesome Star Wars shoes that every fan would want to have and also the journey's exclusive star wars film collage skate shoes so if you want to style around in some vans go check out journeys yep and um you can find some of the styles on vans.com but journeys has gotten some exclusive shoes and that's the store journeys journeys.com if you really can't decide or you know that somebody has something special they like the her universe gift cards are cute and they're purple and they have a little bow and on them so you know you just Think Geek, same thing. We Love Finds, all those places that have Star Wars stuff, you can get a gift card if you just really don't know and want to give your favorite fangirl or fanboy something and know that you're thinking of their fandom when you give it to them. So Yeah, or just get them one of those ones you can buy at Target or Walmart that has a Visa logo. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> all right, well, let's jump into our character discussion for this episode, and it is Han Solo. Who's that? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know who that um, is. So just so you know, Trisha, I'm going to put a little bit more of a structure on our character discussions going forward. Here's how we're going to do it. His first appearance was in A New Hope. That's my first song. He was played by Harrison Ford. And then some of his defining characteristics. I'm sure you've read this list, so it's not going to be a surprise for me to say, what would you consider to be his defining characteristics? Because you already read the thing. He has swagger. He has swag. Swag, swag, swag. We put it out on Twitter, well, not me, but we put it out on Twitter and asked what are, like, three of Han Solo's most defining characteristics, and 1138 said, pants, vest, sideburns. At Top Fence Climber said, quick on the draw, cracking set of wheels that he likes Leia. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that wins it for me. At Nerf Herder Blog said, the falcon, a lopsided grin, and sarcasm. At Brian underscore Nov said Han shot first. <laughs> <laughs> he wins. <laughs> At Jedi underscore Guy, he said he has guile, the devil may care attitude, and solo luck. And then Geek underscore K said bravado, wit, and on the fly planning skills. Some of the ones that I came up with as far as his defining characteristics were self confidence, and sometimes he's overconfident. Um, he's very loyal, even though he doesn't want to act like he is. He's very brave. He's witty. He's full of heart. And he's scruffy. My favorite, favorite Han Solo <laughs> is when he turns and runs after the stormtroopers on the Death Star, because that's just him to me. It's like, he's crazy. Like, he doesn't even think about it. He just does it. And then he gets into the moment. He's like, oh, man, I don't think I should have done that. But it, it works out for him. So I feel like he's one of those or one of the only characters that you can actually go and just do things in that it almost always works out for him in the end. <laughs> <laughs> he's luck. He's got luck. He's got, he's got, he's got luck. solo luck. Is there anything that you just really, really love or loathe about Han Solo? My initial kind of attraction in Star Wars was Luke Skywalker, but Han grew on me, and it was just, you know, he he came around. He's, his heart was always in the right place. He just had, had a, been down a little bit on his luck and the experience. He ended up doing the right things. You know, sometimes people have bad experiences, but you can turn it around and do something really great. And I always wonder, you know, we don't, we don't know, did... Did he go back to save Luke or did he go back to fight the Death Star in A New Hope? It's, I always wonder. I always think that he went back to save Luke. It was about his friends and his friends mattered. 
and Chewbacca sort of tells us that too, right? Because Chewbacca's so loyal to him as a friend. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think he went back to save his friends, and I think he felt bad about leaving people in a bind, and that he knew that his place should be there with them because he is that kind of person. For me, I've never really been a huge Luke Skywalker fan, but I did like Han Solo quite a bit just because he was snarky and he was just kind of like this cocky guy. And I always thought that was really cool. Plus, I really liked his outfit and I just thought his outfit was cool. And he had Chewbacca. I mean, come on. So I've always really liked Han Solo as a character, but I feel like Han Solo has a lot of unanswered questions. I feel like fans want to know a lot more. Like, when did he and Chewie actually first meet? You know, how did that happen? You know, why are they such good friends? What about him and Lando? Like, what went down between him and Lando that caused Han to end up with the Falcon? You know, we never really get answers to any of this stuff. Which is why I want a Han Solo movie. Yeah, if you read, you read some of the books gave answers, but I... But they, they aren't canon. Aren't canon, I know, I know. Some of the stuff about him, you know, being from the Imperial Academy, I think are really cool elements. I hope some of that stuff comes forward. And specifically, you know, Brian Daly really kind of brought him to life in the books. And I know there's a lot of affinity for those books um, within, you know, Lucasfilm. So, you know, I think some stuff will come forward if they can bring it to the big screen or how they do it. So, however, he's definitely a character you can sit down and think about and dream up where he came from. So Definitely. And I'm going to ask you a speculative question. Mm-hmm. Do you think he's going to die in the episode seven? <laughs> you know, I'm the girl that likes to kill famous characters apparently but I you know that was one of the reasons I was really torn about having the original actors come back I know, because, because I would almost think it would be I would it almost feels like if I saw you know see them go through the death scene I don't know if, like if my childhood wouldn't just be shattered so I was like I don't know if I want you know if they're gonna do that to one of those characters I don't want it to be them and that's just some kind of strange I, you know, not being able to separate your inner child from from fiction. So, and everybody has that. If you think you can, everybody has that, especially for stories you've seen as children. Because I think people react crazy ways about things that they watch as kids that they just can't handle anybody bad mouthing when they're adults. But could it, in my mind, the person who would be more likely to die would be Luke Skywalker because I think <laughs> that you want him to die. No, I don't want him to die, but. I don't want him to die, but I I just think that there's always that implication of the happily ever after, and that's never going to come for for Luke and who he is in in the galaxy far far away. So I always worry that if you kind of destroy that, that how are you gonna how are you gonna keep the hope alive? That's me. That's just me, and everybody has a different opinion. So what do you think? Oh, we want to know what I think. Um, I think that Han Solo is probably going to die in Episode 7, and purely based on the fact that I don't think... I think that Harrison Ford probably had that written into his contract. <laughs> he's wanted to, he's, he's wanted, wanted Han Solo to die for a while, so I'm pretty sure he was like, all right, I'll do it, but only <laughs> if he dies. Well, here, but here's here's the thing, just to think about. He's, you know, he's getting up there in years, and sometimes you don't want to face your thinking about your mortality and then really thinking about it. You never know. But I, I don't know. I think that the the original actors are going to play would, no matter if they live or die, are going to play less of a role in the second and third movies of the sequel trilogy. So they could do it either way. But I, I there would definitely be some. They would have to hand me hankies and Kleenex and probably a bucket before I saw it. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, as we wrap this up, I have a question for you. Han shot first, yes or no? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Even George Lucas wore the shirt. He admits it. (laughs) All right. Well, on that thought... We want to thank everybody so much. We appreciate all of our listeners, everybody that's contacted us, that have emailed us, reached out to us on Twitter or Facebook, um, you know, people who send us links on Twitter and Facebook, all those kind of things, and especially those of you who have sent us voicemails. We love getting them. So here's where you can find us. On Twitter, we're at FG Going Rogue. Trisha is at Fangirl Cantina, and I am at Ice Cold Penguin. And it's all the same for Instagram, or all three accounts. 
Um, you can email us. Our email is fangirlsgoingrogue at gmail.com. You can call us and leave a voicemail. And the ladies, we are looking for you to call in and give us your opinions and to ask us the questions. What do you want us to talk about? Because we are here to talk about the things that are important to you. So that voicemail is 331 21 E walks or 331 213 9657. You can go to Facebook. You can like our page, Fangirls Going Rogue. That's all you have to type in. It'll come up. Tumblr, Fangirls Going Rogue, Tumblr.com. And please go like Rebel Force Radio on iTunes and leave a positive review. And in your review, mention how much you love Fangirls Going Rogue. So until next time, yub, yub. 